สวัสดีครับ Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today is our group learning program, and we're in part three of a three-part series where I'm helping you to understand the eightfold path. This is the core teaching of the Buddha. The first class I did the wisdom section. Last class I did the moral conduct section. In this class, we're going to be studying the mental discipline section. This is where you're going to learn about right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. And this is where it really all comes together for you, and you see how everything fits together. Because it's this eightfold path that is going to guide you to the elimination of these discontent feelings, where the mind can be peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy permanently, where you no longer experience any of those discontent feelings. So, welcome to all of you, whether you're joining for the first time or you've been joining regularly. The way that we start our classes is we start with meditation. I'll guide you guys in a breathing mindfulness meditation session, and then afterwards, when we come out, I'm going to share with you the mental discipline section of the Eightfold Path. Walking you through using the words of the Buddha, pausing to see what questions you guys have, and checking in to see if there's any clarity that you guys need that I haven't shared related to the Eightfold Path. So, if you'd like to join for meditation, you might pull up a meditation cushion or a chair or whatever it is that you normally use for meditation. I'm going to ease us into meditation with some chanting, which you guys are welcome to join along in. Just remember, this isn't a rite, a ritual, or a ceremony, or worship. It's just to help bring some awareness to the mind and awareness of the breath. And I'll be teaching this later in the program. And then once we get into meditation, I will share some guidance, and then there'll be a period of time where it'll just be quiet, and then we'll come out with some chanting as well. Ara. สัมมาสัมพุทโธมหาเกวาโอตังมหาเกวันหังอภิวาเตยามีสวัสดีโธมหาเกวตาธรรมโมดามังนามสามีสุปฏิปันโนมหาเกวโตสาวกัสสังโฆสังฆานามามี Nap mora sa pa ke wa tu ara tu sama samputa sa nap mora sa pa ke wa tu ara tu sama samputa sa. นับมรสภาคะวะโตอะระโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะอิติปิสุเอมหาเกวาอะระหังสัมมาสัมมุ We cha cha ra nang sa muno sa ka to ro ka vi tu anu te ro po ri sa na ma sa ti sa ta ta va ma nu. Okay, with the lower body and hands and arms comfortable, and the upper body erect, just close the eyes. And start breathing in through the nose and out through the nose. 
Here you're just looking to establish the breath. A nice, natural, steady, consistent breath. Not forced or controlled. Just a gradual inhale through the nose. Experiencing the full breath. And then when you're ready, exhale out through the nose. Breathing in and out. Breathing in and out. Your breath may not match up with the guidance that I'm providing, and that's okay. This is your practice. I'm just here for guidance. You can use this voice as a reminder that whenever you get to the next inhale, breathing gradually through the nose, developing a nice, natural, steady, consistent breath. And then, whenever you're ready, exhale out through the nose. Breathing in. And out. Breathing in. And out. Once the breath is well established, start fixating the mind on the breath. Either the sound of the breath coming into the nose or the sensation of air moving over the skin into the nose. The breath is the present moment. Fixate the mind on the breath the present moment. Breathing in and out. Breathing in and out. With the mind fixated on the breath, whenever you notice that it moves off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. No need to observe the thoughts, analyze them, judge them, or even try to figure out where they're coming from. Whenever you notice that the mind is moved off the breath, cut that off, let it go and come back to the breath, the present moment. Breathing in and out. Breathing in And out. I'm going to be quiet now and let you do this work of focusing on the breath, cutting off and letting go anytime the mind moves off the breath. You have nowhere to go, there's nothing to do. No one needs you right now. This is your time to focus on the breath. Breathing in and out.
I'm going to be transitioning over to our class, but I'd like to just once again welcome all of you guys. Welcome to our class. Those of you guys that are joining us for the first time or if you've been joining regularly, those of you that joined us since we started meditating, welcome to all of you. Today, what I'm going to be teaching you is the mental discipline section of the Eightfold Path. The mental discipline section is right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. The Eightfold Path is the core central teaching of the Buddha. If you're interested in getting to enlightenment where the mind's permanently peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, you would need to know the Eightfold Path inside and out, backwards and forwards, up, down, left, right. You'd need to know it like the back of your hand, and you're going to need to revisit it multiple times. So here at the beginning of our group learning program, I'm going through it in a three-part series, but then we're going to also, in Chapter 5, I'm going to be teaching you the Eightfold Path all in one class. So here you're getting to be able to absorb it in three individual classes so that we can focus on each individual section. But later, we're going to be learning it as well because you're going to need to revisit this even more than just the two times in this med- in this group learning program. You're going to need to visit even more than that. Remember, you have the book to be reading that you can be diving into this. You have the recordings that these classes are recorded. You have the podcast, the audio books, all these different things. And you even have personal guidance to be able to reach out and get help. So in the very first class, I taught right view and right intention. This was the wisdom section. This is what makes up the foundation of the path to enlightenment. In right view, you learned about the three universal truths of impermanence, discontentedness, and the universal truth of non-self. And you learned about what craving, desire, attachment is, that longing and yearning, the chasing after the objects of your affection. You also learned the Four Noble Truths, where the Buddha explains the problem in the unenlightened mind, the cause of that problem, the elimination of it, and the path forward. The problem in the unenlightened mind is discontentedness, conditioned feelings, where the mind is forming inner feelings based on some condition. And now, if that condition is met, you'll get pleasant feelings. 
But if you don't get what you want, you'll get those painful feelings. And then there's the neither painful nor pleasant feelings as well. So when the mind has craving, desire, attachment, that's what's causing this problem, the longing, the yearning. So the discontentedness is the problem, the conditional feelings that the mind can only be happy in certain situations. And when it doesn't get what it wants, it can't be happy. It's going to experience the sadness, anger, frustration, or some other discontent feeling. So the cause of that is the craving, desire, attachment. That's the second noble truth. That is the longing, the yearning, the mind wanting things to be a certain way, expecting things to be a certain way. And now when your expectations are met, you get happy or excited. But then when they aren't met, you get those painful feelings of sadness, anger, frustration. And because you can't get your expectations met permanently because of the universal truth of impermanence, then even if you form pleasant feelings, those are going to end up changing when the condition changes. And because you can't get your expectations and your wants and your longing and yearning permanently, you're going to end up in the painful feelings at some point. So as long as the mind is forming its inner feelings based in craving, desire, attachment, then you're going to be experiencing the mind going up and down and up and down. So this is the problem, discontentedness, and the cause of that problem is craving, desire, attachment. The third noble truth is explaining that the way to eliminate discontentedness is to eliminate craving, desire, attachment. And you're going to be able to understand how to do that because in the fourth noble truth, the Buddha is explaining the complete path to eliminating discontentedness is the Eightfold Path. So right view is establishing the right view that your own mind is causing your own discontentedness. It's the craving, desire, attachment. It's not about who's to blame or who's at fault, none of that, but just seeing true reality of what's truly occurring. Why are these feelings occurring? Because once you understand what's causing them, then you can focus on eliminating them, implementing the real solutions. So right view is to establish the right view that your mind is causing its own discontentedness. Wrong view would be to blame other people. And mom, you're making me angry. Or dad, you're frustrating me. Or brother, sister, you're annoying me. Or boss, you know, you're making me angry or whatever it is. Any kind of blame to other people that they're causing your inner feelings, this is to not have right view. So more and more, you would like to establish right view where you can look inward and you can see your cravings, your desires, your attachments, your longing, your yearning, chasing after the objects of your affection. That's what's causing the discontent feelings. Then I taught you right intention or right thinking or right thought, where the first part of right intention is the intention of renunciation. Then it's the intention of non-ill will and the intention of harmlessness. What the intention of renunciation is, is willingness to let go and give up the unwholesome things in your life. Willingness to have an open mind and let go of your false beliefs and opinions, bringing in this wisdom that you can now see the truth. Because the very first false belief you need to eliminate is that other people are causing you to be angry or some situation is causing you to be angry. You need to be able to practice the intention or the thinking or the thought of renunciation where you're willing to let that go when you have this wisdom that's coming in. And now you can see the truth that your mind is actually causing these discontent feelings itself. So practicing the intention of renunciation is the willingness to let go and let go of these false beliefs and this unwholesome activities and any kind of thing that the mind's holding on to. And then you need to practice the intention of renunciation. I'm sorry, the intention of non-ill will, which non-ill will is good will or loving kindness, where you have a genuine interest in seeing all beings be well. And then you practice the intention of harmlessness, where you're disinterested or incapable of causing harm to others. This is rounding out the wisdom section of the Eightfold Path, right view and right intention. And then that sets you up to then understand why it's important for you to practice the moral conduct section of right speech, right action, right livelihood. Because as long as you're causing harm through your speech, actions, and livelihood, this is just going to come back to you because of the cause and effect or action and result. When you make a certain wise decision, it's going to produce wholesome results in your life. But when you make unwise decisions, it's going to produce unwholesome results. And this is called gamma or the natural law of gamma this cause and effect or action and result, the results of your decisions. And cultivating wisdom about your moral conduct, now you can practice closer and closer to right speech, right action, right livelihood, and see these wholesome results coming back to you. I shared right speech where you learned about it's wise to refrain from lying, slander, or gossip, 
harsh speech, and frivolous speech. These are the four aspects of right speech. Eliminating lying, slander, harsh speech, and frivolous speech. Frivolous speech is like idle chatter, like yada, 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 yada. And then we went deeper into right speech, and we talked about the five factors of well-spoken speech, where it's wise to speak at the right time, what you say is true, speaking gentle, speak beneficially, and speak with a mind of loving kindness. So during the lifetime of the Buddha, this was right speech because that's all they had was speech. But you're going to need to be able to see this as right communication, that in all situations, you would like to communicate in a way that's wise. So whether it's spoken words, whether it's text messages, social media, email, or any other way that you're communicating through words, you would like to practice right speech. Because if you went into a job interview and you did a really stellar job in the job interview using speech, but they saw your social media and your social media was aggressive and bitter and harsh and hostile, you're probably not going to get the job. So you would like to practice right speech in all aspects of your life to purify your ability to then speak with right speech, realizing that that's going to be challenging, right? You're not going to be able to just snap your fingers and instantly implement that. But what I'm going to teach you today with the mental discipline will help you to put right speech into place. And then with right action, the Buddha teaches to not cause harm through your bodily actions. Any and all bodily actions that are causing harm, this harm is going to come back to you. So you would like to practice in such a way that you're not causing harm through your bodily actions. And the Buddha gives you three very impactful ones, which is killing, stealing, and sexual misconduct. He talks about that in the Eightfold Path. But you'll get more details on that when we talk about this five fa- the uh, five precepts in chapter 7. The five precepts in chapter 7 are going to plug into this and fully illuminate for you what it means to live compassionately for the welfare of all living beings, to await what is given and not steal and not take things. And it's going to help you to understand sexual misconduct. But you can also understand that the Buddha didn't give a comprehensive list about right action because it would be impossible for him to name all the different actions that would potentially cause harm. So you know that it's unwise to punch someone in the face or drag your suitcase down the aisle of a plane and run over people's feet and bump into their knees. This would be wrong action where you're causing harm through your bodily actions. And you would like to purify that where you're not causing harm through your bodily actions. Then I taught you right livelihood, which is how you choose to sustain your life in the world, that you're not interested in sustaining your life based on causing harm to others. Because if you sustain your life and you purchase food, water, clothing, shelter, and medical care through causing harm, then you're going to find that this harm is coming back to you and you're going to have a really difficult time supporting yourself and sustaining your life in the world. So the Buddha gives five livelihoods that would be unwise to practice. He talked about weapons, meat, living beings, the substances that cause heedlessness, and poisons. If you had business or trade in any of those five, it's going to cause harm. So you would like to eliminate those from your practice, that you don't sell weapons, that you don't sell meat, that you don't sell living beings, that you don't sell substances that cause heedlessness, and you don't sell poisons. This would be unwise to participate in a livelihood with that. But then he goes deeper and he explains the way to conduct your livelihood that It's wise to eliminate scheming, flattery, hinting, belittling, and pursuing gain with gain, where you're just chasing after money. That if you were doing these kinds of things, it's going to cause harm in your livelihood, and now you're going to find it more and more challenging to be able to conduct your livelihood and actually support yourself. And I showed you how to learn this intellectually, how to examine it and investigate it, how to reflect on these things to be able to see the truth for yourself about this natural law of karma. And then what you'll need to do is as you've now done that, perhaps the reflection part and the learning part is now start implementing it into your practice slowly but surely bring your practice up more and more where you're practicing the wisdom section and the moral conduct section. And then now we're going to move into the mental discipline section where I'm going to teach you right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. And all of these eight factors, you're practicing them all at the same time. You're not mastering one before you move on to the other. Instead, they're all in support of each other. You could think about this eightfold path like a speaker system where you have eight dials and you're trying to dial these in closer and closer and you get a better and better quality sound out of the speakers. 
Well, the same thing is true that if you dial these eight factors into your life closer and closer, revisiting it from time to time, you'll see the quality of your mind improving and the quality of your life improving. But you need to know what these factors are and then you need to gradually practice them and bring them into your life more and more. So now I'm going to share with you right effort using the words of the Buddha, just like I've done before. And then I'm going to break it down for you and show you how to reflect on it, how to practice it so that you can bring it into your life and experience the real results. All these factors, as I said, are interlinked and working together. So you're going to need to know one in order to practice the other, for example. So here are the words of the Buddha. In what monks is right effort? Here, monks, a monk rouses his will, makes an effort, stirs up energy, exerts his mind and strives to prevent the arising of unarisen, evil, unwholesome mental states. He rouses his will, makes an effort, stirs up energy, exerts his mind and strives to overcome evil, unwholesome mental states that have arisen. He rouses his will, makes an effort, stirs up energy, exerts his mind and strives to produce unarisen, wholesome mental states. He rouses his will, makes an effort, stirs up energy, exerts his mind and strives to maintain wholesome mental states that have arisen, not to let them fade away, to bring them to greater growth, to the full perfection of development. This is called right effort. So here the Buddha is talking about four things that you need to apply effort to do. And here's how this breaks down. The first one, he's talking about preventing unwholesome mental states that have not arisen from arising in the mind. You're going to need to apply the effort to prevent any unwholesome mental states from coming into the mind. Certain unwholesome mental states that are not currently in the mind, the Buddha is saying apply the effort to not allow them to come into the mind. And an example of that might be killing a human being. You probably have no interest in killing a human being. This is probably far outside your mind, that it's not something that you're even seriously thinking about or considering. So the Buddha is saying, apply the effort to abandon that, or I'm sorry, apply the effort to prevent that from ever coming into the mind, that you're not interested in that coming into the mind. And there's other unwholesome mental states that you probably have that aren't in your mind right now, that if you practice this right effort that as you're aware of any unwholesome mental states that are currently not in your mind, you apply the effort to ensure that you prevent them from ever coming into the mind. And you're going to learn about wholesome and unwholesome mental states as you progress on the path. So you're going to need to apply the effort to prevent any unwholesome mental states that are currently not in the mind from ever coming into the mind. The second aspect of this is to abandon unwholesome mental states that have arisen in the mind. So right now, there are certain unwholesome mental states that are currently in your mind. You're going to need to apply the effort to abandon those and purify the mind of those particular unwholesome mental states. Some examples might be you might have a certain craving to have sexual contact outside of an existing relationship. This is a potential that someone could have. And if you know that this is going to cause harm because you've studied this and you know that it would cause harm to you, it would cause harm to your partner, this is why people get beat up, this is why they get murdered, this is why sexually transmitted diseases occur, this is why all kinds of problems happen. You can even lose your reputation in your community as this kind of thing is being discovered. So you would like to abandon that. If that's arising in your mind, that's an unwholesome quality that's currently in your mind. You need to abandon that out of the mind by applying the effort to cut that off and eliminate it. And then if there's anger, frustration, or irritation, or any other discontent feeling that is arising, you're going to need to apply the effort to eliminate that from the mind because that's an unwholesome quality. Any conditioned feeling that is arising is an unwholesome quality. And you're going to need to apply the effort through your dedication, your determination, and your diligence, that you're not complacent in allowing that thought to just continue to permeate in the mind, you're going to need to cut it off and let it go. And then the third one is to produce unarisen wholesome mental states to arise in the mind. This is any wholesome mental states that are currently not in your mind. You're going to need to apply the effort to bring those into the mind. And once again, you're going to learn about various wholesome qualities on this path. And you'll see certain wholesome qualities are not currently in your mind. And you're going to need to apply the effort to bring those in. An example might be generosity. 
as you learn about generosity, which is the giving and sharing of more than is strictly required in any given situation without any expectation of anything in return, giving your time, effort, energy, or resources, this is going to help you eliminate craving, desire, attachment. So if you know that you're kind of a selfish person or you find it very hard or very challenging to ever share, you're going to need to apply effort to bring this generosity into your mind when you're at work, when you're at your family life, when you're experiencing other things, you're going to need to learn how to give and share practicing generosity that trains your mind to let go. And you're going to need to apply the effort to do that. No one's going to be there with you to do that. You're going to need to do that effort. Or maybe compassion. Compassion is the concern for the misfortune of others. If you notice that you're kind of indifferent when people experience some unfortunate situation and you're just like, ah, so what? Who cares? That's them. That's not me. If you notice that, that means compassion is not in your mind. You're going to need to apply the effort to bring that into the mind. That's what number three is. The Buddha is sharing to apply the effort to produce unarisen wholesome mental states. That this is something that's not in your mind and you're trying to bring this wholesome mental state into your mind. And then the fourth one is to maintain wholesome mental states that have arisen, not allowing them to fade away and work to increase their growth in the mind. This is that you have certain wholesome mental states that are currently in your mind and you're going to need to apply the effort to continue to grow those and develop them, bring them to full perfection and full development in the mind. An example of that might be loving kindness. You might be loving and kind. You might have this genuine interest in seeing certain beings be well. But in certain other situations, maybe you're angry and bitter and harsh and hostile and you're vindictive or resentful or having a grudge or something like that. So your loving kindness hasn't been brought to full growth or full perfection of development because there's still beings in your life that you have anger or hatred or frustration or annoyance or dislike towards. So you're going to need to apply the effort to bring this loving kindness up into the mind more and more and more. You're going to need to maintain it and help it grow in the mind. Or sympathetic joy is another example. Sympathetic joy is the opposite of jealousy or envy. This is where you have joy for other success, even if you didn't contribute to it. So maybe you have this wholesome quality. Maybe when you see something fortunate happen for someone, you're like, oh, I'm really pleased for you. That's really wonderful. It's wonderful you got a new car or, oh, that's great. You're going on vacation or, oh, that's outstanding that you got a raise. You know, you might feel joy for other success, even though you didn't contribute to it. But in other situations, maybe you're a little bit jealous or a little bit envious. So it hasn't been brought to full growth and full perfection. So that's where you're going to need to apply the effort to do that. And these here are just examples that I'm using to illustrate what right effort is. But the examples here are going to be unique to you. The things that are unwholesome, that are currently not in your mind, that you're going to need to prevent from coming in your mind, those are going to be unique to you. The unwholesome qualities that you need to abandon that are currently in your mind, that's unique to you. To produce unarisen wholesome mental states, meaning bring in wholesome mental states that are currently not in your mind, that's going to be unique to you. And then to maintain certain wholesome mental states, bringing in the full growth and perfection and development in the mind, that's going to be unique to you too, because you have certain wholesome qualities in your mind that others may or may not have yet. And this is why you can see it's an independent journey. You can't compare yourself and judge yourself from one person to the next. That's unwise to do. That would be coming from one's own ego. So where you see that your mind's judging other people, you need to cut that off. That would be an unwholesome mental state that you need to cut off and eliminate. So here you can see that you're on your own independent journey and what wholesome qualities that are currently in your mind or that you need to bring into your mind are unique to you or what unwholesome qualities that you need to prevent or abandon out of the mind is going to be unique to you. So let me pause and see if you guys have any questions on right effort to understand what this is. You can put this into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom. Or in Zoom, you can raise your hand electronically and ask any and all questions that you like. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions anywhere. So I'm going to move on to the next step, which is right mindfulness. Again, I'm going to read this to you using the original words of the Buddha. 
and then I'm going to break it down for you and help you understand how to understand it, how to reflect on it, and then how to practice it. So here's the words of the Buddha on right mindfulness. In what monks is right mindfulness? Here, monks, a monk resides reflecting on body as body, dedicated, clearly aware and mindful, having put aside craving and worry for the world. He resides reflecting on feelings as feelings, dedicated, clearly aware and mindful, having put aside craving and worry for the world. He resides reflecting on mind as mind, dedicated, clearly aware and mindful, having put aside craving and worry for the world. He resides reflecting on mental objects as mental objects, dedicated, clearly aware and mindful, having put aside craving and worry for the world. This is called right mindfulness. So here, this is the Buddha describing mindfulness, and specifically, he's describing the four foundations of mindfulness. There's other places in his teachings where he adds more content around right mindfulness, but here in the Eightfold Path, he's sharing that you need to develop the four foundations of mindfulness. So let me help you understand what mindfulness is first. In general, when somebody first starts learning about the path to enlightenment, I encourage you to maybe think about right mindfulness as awareness of mind. This is a great way to just kind of start out with your development on the path to enlightenment is to understand right mindfulness is just awareness of mind. You're trying to gain this awareness of what's going on in your mind. Because in the unenlightened state, we don't really pay attention to what's going on in the mind. We just kind of plow through life. We're kind of plowing through the forest, knocking down the trees, burning up the forest. We look behind us and we're like, whoa, who knocked down all the trees? Where's all that smoke coming from? Well, it was us who made all those unwise decisions that knocked down all the trees. So what you're looking to do as you first get started on the path to enlightenment is to develop this awareness of mind where you're starting to understand what's going on in your mind, that you're no longer interested in pursuing these selfish desires, but you start being aware of what kind of thoughts and ideas that you're having. What are the wholesome qualities? What are the unwholesome qualities? You start developing this awareness of mind, and that might be where you stay for a period of time is just developing awareness of mind. And your breathing mindfulness meditation, which is part of the next step, right, concentration, is gonna help you to be able to do this. But then more detail, as you're developing on the path more and more, you're gonna to need to develop what's called the four foundations of mindfulness. The four foundations of mindfulness are having awareness of the bodily sensations, the feelings, the condition of the mind, and the mental objects. What the Buddha's cluing you into here is he's cluing you into the life cycle that your discontentedness is going to take as you have craving, desire, attachments in the mind and you experience contact through your eyes, your ears, your nose, your tongue, the body, and the mind itself. When you're experiencing agreeable contact, you're going to get pleasant feelings. But when you experience disagreeable contact, you're going to get painful feelings. These are the conditioned feelings. But before that occurs, there's bodily sensations associated with all of these discontent feelings, whether they're pleasant, painful, or neither painful nor pleasant. There's some bodily sensation that is occurring. This is like an early warning system, helping you to understand, hey, discontentedness is about to arise. The mind is about to form a conditioned feeling. And you have the opportunity right there to take action, that you can cut it off and let it go. What these bodily sensations are, are things like if you were about to get angry, you might have felt like tingling in the body, rising up from the feet to the head. You might have felt tightening in your chest, maybe pain around your heart, maybe tightening in your throat, maybe heat in your face or pressure in the skull. You should be able to directly reflect on certain situations where you've been angry or frustrated and you might see these kinds of symptoms. Or you may not be aware of them at all, that they're actually occurring. That's where you need to develop more mindfulness because you can actually cut off and let go of discontentedness as a bodily sensation. As you develop more and more, you'll be able to cut it off and let it go. Because if you don't, then it's going to form a feeling. So you're not suppressing your feelings here. That's not what the Buddha is teaching you. Sometimes people think that's the case, but instead you're catching it before it ever became a feeling. You're catching it as a bodily sensation. So essentially you're having some contact through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. And the mind is experiencing these bodily sensations and it's about to form a conditioned feeling. And if you apply right effort at the bodily sensations, you can say, nope, I'm not gonna let you do that. You can rewire your mind to no longer form conditioned feelings. 
So if you can develop awareness of the mind in these four foundations of mindfulness, now when you're seeing those bodily sensations and you know the mind's about to form a conditioned feeling, if you've been training in meditation enough, you can cut that off and let it go, not allowing the mind to form a conditioned feeling. And now you've protected the mind so that you can remain peaceful and you can remain joyful. If you do this enough, then you'll eliminate your cravings, desires, attachments, and there won't be any arising of any discontentedness. But in the process of getting there, you're going to need to be observant of those bodily sensations and then cut it off and let it go before it becomes a feeling. Because once it becomes a feeling, now you have a real problem to deal with. Your mind's angry, your mind's frustrated, you're agitated, and you got to get rid of this. This is kind of like if you were out in the middle of the ocean, maybe going from the USA to England, you're out in the middle of the ocean and the water's flooding into the boat. And now you've got a real problem. You've got to get this water out. So what you would like to do is you would like to prevent this from ever occurring. You'd like to prevent the water from ever coming into the boat so you can sail from the US all the way to England without any issues. So that's why you're cutting off at the bodily sensations, not allowing the mind to experience conditioned feelings. But understand, this takes time to develop. This takes many months, maybe even a year or two, to actually develop the ability to do this in every single situation. So you're going to need to start developing a bit by bit. Well, if you miss it as a bodily sensation, and it does become a feeling, because that's going to occur. Your mind is going to get angry. Your mind is going to get frustrated between now and enlightenment. You're going to experience some conditioned feelings. So if it does become a feeling and you missed it as a bodily sensation, cut it off as a feeling. You can redirect the mind. You can take it in another direction. If you're sitting there watching the news and you feel this frustration building, cut off the news and walk. go outside for a walk. Go out for a bike ride. Go to the bathroom and wash your hands. Go do something else. Redirect the mind to cut off those feelings so that the mind doesn't have to form that conditioned feeling. Well, if you miss it as a feeling and you don't cut it off there, now it's going to affect the condition of your mind. This is where you've been angry or frustrated or agitated for multiple hours or multiple days, or maybe even a week or two, right? You remember that when you were agitated for like a week or two? That's because you didn't understand this. You didn't have the wisdom of this. So you didn't catch it as a bodily sensation. You didn't cut it off and let it go as a feeling. So it started affecting the condition of the mind. We've all experienced this, right? Where you were irritable or grumpy or agitated for multiple hours or days, or maybe even a week or two. So you can cut it off there if you have this general awareness of the condition of your mind and you're noticing that you're generally grumpy and irritable for a few hours. Ho, 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 hold on a second. Let's cut that off. Let's redirect the mind. Let's get rid of this, right? So you can do that as you observe and notice the condition of the mind. This is the awareness of right mindfulness. Because if you don't cut it off and let it go at one of these stages, it's going to be feeding what's called a mental object. A mental object is a deeply rooted container in the mind that is holding on in the mind. This is the pollution of the mind. When we talk about pollution of the mind or the taints or the fetters or the defilements, this is those. Those mental objects are deeply rooted in the mind. And now you need to be aware of what those are. Next class, next Sunday, I'm going to be teaching you the 10 fetters, the 10 individual pollutions that are in the mind so that you can understand what these are. And these are the mental objects. So you're going to need to have awareness of these, of what the symptoms are because of these. And this takes time to build up. You know, this isn't something you're going to be able to walk away from today's class and be able to do instantly. So I'm just giving you this overview, but going in deep into it so you can see how much depth the path to enlightenment really is. So an example of a mental object would be something like ill will. That's a mental object, deeply rooted container in the mind or conceit, which is like arrogance or pride or boastfulness or judging other people, putting yourself above or below people. This is a mental object. So using this example of the four foundations of mindfulness in the mental object of ill will, when we were all born, we didn't have ill will in our mind. We don't go to the nursery hating other babies or having anger. We don't go to the nursery doing that kind of stuff. We don't go to the nursery judging other babies and trying to determine if we're better than them or not, right? We don't have conceit. We don't have those mental objects when we're born. They get formed over time through our experiences in life. So when we were maybe two years old, three years old, four years old, we said, mommy, mommy, daddy, daddy, I want chocolate. I want ice cream. 
And in some cases, they gave it to us. And ah, we got so excited and so happy because it's ice cream time. It's chocolate time. Yay. We got all these conditioned, pleasant feelings. And then that craving grew and grew and grew. And at some point, mom and dad said, no, you can't have chocolate. You can't have ice cream. And now we got frustrated. We got angry. We got upset. And we blamed mom and dad. We thought they were the worst mom and dad we've ever had ever in our life, right? They are the problem. But in reality, it's our craving desire attachment. And now because we didn't get what we wanted, there was these bodily sensations that were occurring. There was this conditioned feeling of the anger, the sadness, the frustration. It started affecting the condition of the mind. And now it started forming this mental object of ill will. So what the Buddha is teaching you is this early warning system of the bodily sensations that you can put a blockade there that you can cut off and let go and cut off and let go and cut off and let go so that now you can work on uprooting these mental objects, that there are certain tools and techniques that you're going to learn on the path to understand what these mental objects are. And then you're going to apply those and uproot them out of the mind. So this is right mindfulness where you're understanding the four foundations of mindfulness and getting more and more in touch with awareness of mind, but then more specifically, Awareness of the bodily sensations, the feelings, the condition of the mind, and these mental objects. And this is how you purify the mind, is by having mindfulness. Without mindfulness, you wouldn't be able to purify your mind, because mindfulness is going to help you to be aware of what's going on in the mind. You wouldn't be able to apply right effort without right mindfulness. Right mindfulness is required in order to apply right effort, because you need to be able to see with right mindfulness, what are the wholesome qualities and what are the unwholesome qualities and then either apply right effort to abandon those or cultivate them in the mind. So right mindfulness is really key to help you to develop on the path so that you can purify the mind. Now, some people nowadays, when they talk about right mindfulness or they use the word mindfulness, they will describe mindfulness or use it in replace of the word careful. You might hear somebody say, can you mindfully take this glass of water to the table? right? Or can you mindfully carry this glass of water to the table? What they're really saying is, can you carefully carry this glass of water to the table? So you're going to need to be able to see through that. And while other people may not understand what right mindfulness is or what the word mindfulness is in the way that the Buddha used it, you're going to need to know more and more how this word mindfulness is used. It means awareness of mind, that you have awareness of the mind of what's wholesome and what's unwholesome. And this is how you're going to develop more and more on the path. And you might just stick with awareness of mind for now, but then as you develop more and more, developing all the various factors, you're going to need to develop the four foundations of mindfulness. So let me know what questions you guys have here on right mindfulness. You can put that into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can raise your hand in Zoom and ask any questions that you like. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions anywhere. So I'm going to move on to right concentration. I'm not going to read right concentration because here in right concentration, the Buddha is describing the jhanas. You can read this at some point if you like. It's in the book. What a jhana is, is a jhana is a preliminary phase that the mind goes through before you get to the first stage of enlightenment. And it's practicing all the eight factors of the Eightfold Path that is going to produce these jhanas. These are heightened qualities of mind. It's kind of like the light bulb is flickering. It's giving you an indication that you're putting together the Eightfold Path really well, and you're starting to notice these heightened qualities of mind. So right concentration in the Eightfold Path is describing the results of having put together the Eightfold Path. It's describing some of the benefits that you're going to experience as a result of developing the Eightfold Path. But in terms of practicing right concentration, the Buddha talks about this in other teachings. So this word jhana is the only other word that I still need to use in Pali, the word gamma and the word jhana, because they don't translate to just one English word. The word jhana is like meditative absorption, that the mind has absorbed a certain amount of meditation, or mental absorption, that it's absorbed a certain amount of mental understanding of the teachings. So that's what you're doing on the path to enlightenment is you're developing your entire practice and the mind has absorbed a certain amount of benefit from the teachings, which is mental absorption, and it's benefited a certain amount through practicing the teachings like meditation and right speech and all those others. So you would need to be practicing all those factors 
to now move the mind into the jhanas. And you're going to start noticing these improved qualities of mind. This significant discontentedness is going to be decreased. There's going to be this decrease in discontentedness, and the mind's going to be more focused and more concentrated. But the way that you practice right concentration in order to experience these four jhanas is being shared here, that there's two aspects to this, that there's developing a meditation practice and there's practicing singleness of mind in daily life. Your meditation practice consists of breathing mindfulness meditation and loving kindness meditation. So this is why I've been helping you to develop your breathing mindfulness meditation practice. And then starting in about a week and a half, I'm going to start a four part series to help you develop loving kindness meditation. These are the two solutions to three of the major problems that the Buddha discovered. So you know about craving, desire, attachment right now, but you're going to deepen your understanding of what's really going on in the unrelated mind when you understand the 10 fetters and you understand what's called the three poisons or the three unwholesome roots. So I've put this program together in such a way that it's laid out that you're going to be able to gradually progress in your development. But here I'm showing you where breathing mindfulness meditation and loving kindness meditation plug in because those are things that you're going to learn. And you'll see that breathing mindfulness meditation eliminates one of the major problems, which is craving, desire, attachment. And loving kindness meditation eliminates the anger, the hatred, the ill will, and all those lesser versions like frustration, agitation, and annoyance. It even helps you to eliminate negative self-talk in the mind. If you have like a degrading, diminishing inner dialogue, you can eliminate that through loving kindness meditation, which I'm going to teach you in about a week and a half. So this is part of your practice of right concentration. There's two other specialized meditations that are shared on an as-needed basis. There's one to eliminate sexual cravings, and there's one to help you realize non-self. Not everybody's going to need these two, but they're there. They're in Chapter 11 of Volume 1, and I teach these when we get to that point and other classes, courses, and retreats. I teach those, but here, right concentration is consisting of breathing mindfulness meditation and loving kindness meditation with these other meditations being used on an as-needed basis. Not everyone's going to need those. And you would like to gradually build up your meditation practice to two or three sessions per day for 30 minutes or more. And right now, that can sound like a lot, depending on where you are in your life. But this is something you build up gradually. Over six months, a year, two years, you gradually build up to two or three sessions for 30 minutes or more. What you'll notice is frequency is more important than duration. So if it's a matter of one session for 30 minutes or two for 15, go for the two for 15 and then gradually expand that 15 minutes longer and longer and longer. If you're coming to class on Sundays, we're typically meditating for anywhere from 20 minutes on up. That's kind of what I do. I kind of get right in the middle of that, you know, 15, 20 minutes of meditation, depending on how you keep time of the meditation. And this will help you to gradually expand your meditation. So you would like to kind of start clearing some things out of your life. Maybe you're doing some unbeneficial things. Maybe you're spending an exorbitant amount of time on social media or an exorbitant amount of time uh, on YouTube or other things that are unbeneficial for you. So as you start peeling those things away out of your life, you can make more and more time for things like meditation. And you can do this gradually. Again, it's your own independent practice. You're not comparing yourself to anyone else. You just gradually build up over the months ahead to get to a point where you can meditate two or three times for 30 minutes per session. Then the other part of right concentration is practicing singleness of mind in daily life. This is where you train your mind to do just one thing at a time. If you've been taught multitasking, this is part of the unknowing of true reality that the mind has, that oftentimes people are taught to multitask. And this is supposed to produce more beneficial results and make you more productive. But in reality, it's actually doing just the opposite because the mind can't actually multitask. The human mind can only do one thing at a time. When you're multitasking, you're doing one thing for three seconds, five seconds, 10 seconds, and then you're rapidly cycling to the other thing for three, five, 10 seconds. And then you're rapidly cycling to another thing for some amount of time. And your mind's rapidly cycling from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing. And then when you get home at the end of your day, you're feeling stress, you're feeling anxiety, you're finding it hard to relax and be comfortable because your mind's just go, 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 go. It's overactive. You're lacking concentration because the mind is bouncing around from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing. So if you're talking on the phone to your mom, you're watching TV, maybe you're eating a sandwich, you're not actually doing those three things all at one time. You're bouncing around from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing. 
And now when you're talking to your mom, that phone call goes longer than it really needs to. You don't remember everything when you got off the phone. You might even need to follow up and ask, what are the things you agreed to because you can't remember? You might even use wrong speech and damage your reputation. Whereas if you just did one thing at a time, this phone call would be much shorter. You could be very targeted, very purposeful. You can still be warm and loving and gentle and all those kinds of things, but you can just be targeted and you can be focused. And then if you agree to a particular thing, you'll remember what that is so that you can follow through with that action item. Or if you're using right speech, you can bring forth your full wisdom to make sure you don't damage your relationship. Because in a situation where the conversation goes longer, where you have to go back and clean it up, or you have to go back and find out what it is you agreed to, it's actually taking you more time. In this TV program, you didn't really actually digest that either and benefit from that. And you didn't benefit from the sandwich either because now maybe you have a stomach ache from eating too fast. So you're gonna to need to do just one thing at a time. And this will train the mind to be more focused and more targeted, more concentrated. Because when you're rapidly cycling from thing to thing to thing, your mind isn't able to do that in a concentrated way. The mind's gonna be rapidly cycling. And where this comes from is in the 1960s. This is when multitasking came out because computers came out in the 1960s. And a computer chip can actually multitask. But human beings thought, well, hey, we should be able to do that too. A computer chip can do multiple processes at one time, but a human being's mind can't. So you're just rapidly cycling and you're making the difficult issues in the mind where the mind can't concentrate. So by doing just one thing at a time, you're getting more focused. So if you're washing dishes and your mind wanders, you would like to cut that off and let it go. Or if you're in a business meeting and your mind wanders, you would like to cut that off and let it go and bring it back to the business meeting. Or if you're in this class and you're listening to me talk, you would like to just be listening to me talk. Rather than surfing the internet or looking at your phone or doing any number of other things, you would like to just do one thing. And this is actually training your mind during the time that I'm talking during class to practice singleness of mind. And then in other parts of your life, you do that same thing, that wherever you see the mind roaming and wandering, you cut that off and let it go and you bring the mind back to the present moment and whatever it is that you're doing. This will help you to develop the focus and concentration. An analogy that I can give you is that if you had a piece of wood and you had a steel rod and you grinded this steel rod back and forth over the wood, initially that steel rod's gonna bounce around a whole lot because there's no groove there yet. So it's gonna be bouncing around a lot. So right now, whatever the condition of your mind is, it might be bouncing around in these certain situations. You can't stay focused and concentrated. But if you grind this steel rod back and forth more and more and more, it gets a nice groove in the wood. And then it's less and less likely to bounce out. And when it does bounce out, you'll notice it and you'll be able to bring it right back. But if you bring this steel rod back and forth across the wood enough times, eventually you're going to get a deeper and deeper groove in the wood and it won't bounce out. It's just going to always stay focused and concentrated. And that's what you ultimately would like to get to with your meditation practice by focusing on the breath. You're training the mind like that steel rod to create that groove. But initially, it's going to be bouncing around a lot because you don't have a groove yet. Or when you're washing dishes or in a business meeting or you're in a class like this, you would like to focus, have singleness of mind, understanding that it's not going to do that easily initially. So it's going to bounce around for a while. But if you do this enough, over time, you'll notice more focus and more concentrated, more concentration. And this is going to help you. You'll get more memory as well, more clarity in your mind. And now in your personal professional life, you'll be able to really perform optimally with this mind that is more concentrated. So here, this is right concentration. As you develop a meditation practice and you develop singleness of mind in daily life, realizing that this is gradual training, gradual practice, and gradual progress. And then just to kind of summarize this, and then I'll open up to any and all questions you guys have related to right concentration or anything else you guys would like to talk about, is that what we discussed today is we talked about right effort, which is taking initiative to eliminate unwholesome aspects of the mind and cultivate certain wholesome qualities in the mind. And then we talked about right mindfulness, where we're talking about awareness of the mind with the four foundations of mindfulness, developing awareness of the bodily sensations, the feelings, the condition of the mind, and the mental objects. And there we just talked about right concentration, where you're developing your meditation practice and practicing singleness of mind to the point where the mind is experiencing these jhanas, where this is the light bulb flickering because your mind has absorbed a certain amount of meditation, 
you've absorbed a certain amount of the mental teachings. And now through the meditation and through practicing singleness of mind in daily life, these heightened qualities are starting to be experienced in the mind. And you'll be able to see this for yourself. And then what I'll share here at the end is just understand that you're going to need to learn all these different teachings. And these are all things that I'm going to walk you through and help you learn. I've provided all the resources to help you that the three universal truths and four noble truths, you've learned that already, but you're going to be revisiting that several times in this program because it's so key. The Eightfold Path, you're going to need to learn, reflect, and practice that, and you're going to revisit that again. I'm going to be teaching you the five precepts in chapter seven, and you're going to be developing your meditation practice all the way through the entire program. And then next week, I'm going to teach you the 10 fetters and the four stages of enlightenment, that putting together this Eightfold Path is going to lead to these jhanas And that's where you then need to focus on eliminating the 10 fetters so that the mind can actually move into the four stages of enlightenment. And I'll teach you that next week. But remember, all these things that I'm teaching you, you're not going to be able to just instantly learn and instantly practice. You need to gradually develop this. So this is maybe the first time that you've learned this. And you can talk to some of the students who are joining, who've maybe attended this program regularly, that They've actually maybe taken this program two, three, four different times, and they're continuing to learn and continue to develop their practice, and they're continuing to see improvement in the condition of their mind. And that's where I'd like to share with you to never, ever give up on your development of your life practice, because giving up on your life practice or giving up on meditation is like relegating yourself to anger and sadness for the rest of your life. And if you do that, it's just like, all right, well, I'm just going to be resentful and grumpy and bitter for the rest of my life. I'm just going to deal with it. But instead, you would like to stay focused and dedicated in realizing that these discontent feelings are impermanent. They're not permanent in your mind. You can eradicate them from the mind. You don't have to live with the painful feelings and all these other discontent feelings that are arising. But if you give up, then these things will continue to occur. So your enlightenment isn't going to be determined on whether you miss meditation today or not, because it's not possible for you to go from now all the way to the end of your life and do two to three days, two to three sessions of meditation for the rest of your life. It's not possible for you to do that from right now, from this moment. You're going to experience situations where some days you get one meditation, some days you get two, maybe some days you get three, maybe one day here or there, you might even get none. Right. But if you're gradually building up your practice over the course of months and years, your enlightenment is going to be determined on can you consistently meditate and consistently come to class and consistently read the book? Can you consistently get help from your teacher over a consistent long term period over the next two years, three years, four years, 10 years? Can you consistently build up your practice? So if you look at two meditation sessions a day and you look at a month, 30 days, That means that you would be meditating 60 times in one month. Well, if you get 52 or 55, it's okay. You're still going to get to enlightenment if you can do that for the next several years, right? So if you miss meditation here or there, it's okay, right? Of course, you would like to be as dedicated and diligent as possible, but missing a meditation here or there isn't going to determine whether you get to enlightenment or not. What's going to determine if you get to enlightenment or not is now that you've missed a meditation, What do you do next? Do you allow that to be one week, one month, one year that you're not meditating? Or do you realize, hmm, I missed meditation today. I better get back into that. Okay, let me get right back on that, right? That's what's going to determine whether you get to enlightenment. Can you eradicate the complacency, becoming determined, dedicated, and diligent, developing this life practice, dialing it in slowly but surely? So that's what you would ultimately like to work towards and never, ever, ever giving up. So let me know what questions you guys have on anything that we've discussed today. You can put that into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can raise your hand in Zoom and ask any questions that you like. So it looks like Marcy has her hand up. If you'd like to go ahead, ma'am. Thank you, Teacher David. So as you were talking about practicing singleness of the mind, um, so I have, the mind has this um, routine where I take notes during classes. Would it be more beneficial to the mind for me to set aside trying to take notes and just listen and practice that as the singleness? Am I trying to, am I like cycling the mind back and forth between writing the notes and and listening? You can consciously go back and forth where you're listening and then now you're writing and you're doing that consciously as two individual steps. It's not back and forth, back and forth. It's very consciously, very methodically listening taking notes, listening, taking notes. 
you can do those two things. So it's not about whether you're involved in multiple things or not. Like here, like you, like you're wisely pointing out that listening and taking notes are two different things, but you would like to do that consciously. Same thing. Like if I'm washing dishes and I have something in the microwave and I'm also heating up a pot on the stove, the microwave and the stove are doing those things. I'm not doing those things. I'm just focusing on the dishes. But now when the buzzer goes off on the microwave, I'm stopping the dishes and I'm consciously moving to the microwave to address that. And now when I'm done with that, I'm consciously moving over to the stove and handling that situation. But if you run back and forth and rapidly cycle, that's what you're not interested in doing. So how would I be able to delineate knowing that I'm consciously moving from one task to another? It, it, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. how, do, how, how do I make the mind aware that I'm doing that? It's at the speed that you're doing it. So if you're doing it really quick, really rapid, that's the, the craving desire attachment that you're rapidly cycling from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing. So you would like to, you're washing dishes, beep, 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 beep. Oh, okay, stop and now move over. You're consciously moving over rather than hurrying up, you know, dropping the dishes down, running over to the microwave. You're just, okay, time to address the microwave. You set your sponge down, you walk over, you open the microwave consciously. You're not doing it really hurriedly. This is why you're not going to spill things. You're not going to trip over things. You're not going to drop things in your kitchen and break them. You know, you'll probably do those things occasionally, but you will be able to get to the point where you're consciously making wise decisions and you're not tripping over your feet. You're not slamming the microwave. You're not, you know, stabbing yourself with a knife. You're not doing any of those kinds of things because you're doing it consciously. When you're making wise decisions, you'll experience wholesome results and you won't experience those kinds of things. So just, just so I'm clear. So like you will see something and then it triggers a reflection. So then I consciously take that reflection and I write it down to kind of like, uh, solidify it in the mind and then go back. But I'm not quickly like rushing to write down every word you're saying. Right. So that would be the two differentiations. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Right. And when, when you look at your, when you look at your, when, you know, when you're done, your hands not hurting, your your head's not hurting. You haven't scribbled all over the paper. You're very methodically writing out notes, nice and neat, nice and consciously. You're you know you're doing this in a consistent way where you're not just longing, yearning, and chasing after this thing. Because if there's craving, that's what the mind's going to do. Okay, let me see if we have any other questions anywhere. Hey, it looks like we have a question on Facebook from Mayu Lee. She says, I find that when I miss meditation, the mind tends to get complacent, even though I get right back at it. During the next meditation, the mind seemed to be less calm and the mind tend to jump to thought to thought super fast. Yeah, this is your gamma. This is the results of your decisions. That when you make unwise decisions, it's going to produce unwholesome results. But when you make wise decisions, it produces wholesome results. So when you wisely choose to string together meditation day after day after day, that's where those wholesome results are coming back to you. But when you don't do meditation, those pollutions of mind rise up in the mind and now you're less concentrated, you're less calm. So that's why you need to stay dedicated and diligent to that and understand that if you don't, that's where making the unwise decision, these unwholesome results will come back to you. Okay. Let's see. We have a question coming in here on Zoom, I might have missed this one earlier. I apologize. This is from Fiona. Hello, teacher. Is anxiety a mental object? I need to eliminate anxiety, which holds me back in life. Which parts of the Eightfold Path should I concentrate on to eliminate anxiety? Anxiety is not a mental object. Anxiety is a conditioned feeling that is arising due to a mental object. The mental object is central desire, which you guys are going to learn about. When we talk about craving, desire, attachment, it's coming from this mental object of central desire. So anxiety is the discontentedness. That's the problem. The cause of this is craving, desire, attachment. The elimination of anxiety is to eliminate craving, desire, attachment. The way to do that is the Eightfold Path. So the way that you're going to eliminate this, this anxiety is you need to learn each individual step. It's not just one step or two steps or three steps that's going to eliminate the anxiety. It's practicing all the steps. 
So this is the entire path to enlightenment. And not only is this path going to eliminate your anxiety, but every other discontent feeling that you have too. So this entire path is coming together to eliminate the cause of the anxiety, which is the craving desire attachment. So you're going to need each individual factor to gradually build this up. When students first start out on the path, the Buddha and I, what we do is we teach right view. That's the very first thing. That's why the very first class or the, you know, it wasn't the very first class, but the second class of the group learning program, the first class was the introduction. The first class where I taught the teachings, it was right view. It was the Four Noble Truths. You needed to know that right up front. And then you move into your moral conduct and start cleaning up your moral conduct, right speech, right action, right livelihood. You need to get a handle on that. You need to shut down your unwise decisions because this is just going to produce unwholesome results coming back to you. And then you start at the same time developing your meditation practice and all these factors as part of mental discipline that you're gradually dialing that in closer and closer and closer. So all of these factors are working together. You wouldn't be able to eliminate anxiety with just one or two or three or even seven of these factors. You need all eight in order to eliminate anxiety. So that's why you'd like to really take your time through these classes and reading the book and maybe even watching the replay of these classes to be able to really soak this in more and more and more. And it's just going to take time for you to do that. Okay, it looks like Julia has a question here. Thank you, Teacher David. How do we get rid of regret and stop living in the past? Same thing. It's the AFO path. It's the learning and practicing of the AFO path. This is the complete solution. This is the thing that's going to solve all of those discontent feelings because the underlying problem that's causing anxiety and regret and stress and sadness and anger and all those different things, the guilt, the shame, the fear, all of it is coming from the same exact cause, which is craving desire attachment. And it's the Eightfold Path that's going to eliminate that. So that's why right here up front in this group learning program, I share the Eightfold Path because you're going to need to learn that inside and out, backwards and forward. So if you gradually build up what I'm teaching you, which is make sure you understand right view and you understand right intention and you dial that in closer and closer. Develop a right speech, right action, right livelihood. Start working on those. And at the same time, start working on right effort, right mindfulness and right concentration with your breathing mindfulness meditation and gradually building this up. So you're not going to be able to, you know, it's not like a pill that you take a pill and something immediately gets fixed. And you can't take a pill and eliminate anxiety and you can't take a pill and eliminate regret, right? It might cover the symptoms a little bit, but it's not it's not solving the underlying cause or condition that's causing this, which is the craving desire attachment. So you would like to develop each individual factor slowly but surely. And here I've introduced you over three classes to all of them. And if you're working on building up your meditation practice and all these other things, just gradually work on this eightfold path, dialing this in closer and closer. So you're not going to be an expert at this in just three weeks that I've been teaching you. But instead, you can gradually revisit this over time. So that's why we've got that long week in between each class. So it gives you time to read the book, to listen to the replay, to develop your meditation practice. If you're doing the work outside of class, you'll see the improvement to the condition of your mind. I know with 100% certainty that these teachings that I'm sharing with you from the Buddha will lead to your enlightenment. If you investigate them close enough, if you examine them close enough, and you reflect on them to verify them, and you practice them, they will absolutely lead to the elimination of your discontent feelings. But you'll need to do the work outside of class to really dial this in closer and closer. Okay, it looks like Joe has a question as well. He says, the more I learn in our classes, the more I realize how much work I have ahead of me or how far from true reality I am. Yes, that's part of learning is to, you know, look at that, right? And, and look at that in a positive way that, hey, it's kind of nice to be in kindergarten all over again, right? It's kind of nice to start from the beginning and kind of build your life from square one, right? Because however old we are, we've gone through life without even understanding this natural law of gamma. You know, can you imagine going through life not understanding the natural law of gravity? But we've gone through life not understanding this cause and effect. We've gone through life not training our mind. So no, no wonder that we have anxiety. No wonder we have regret. No wonder we have stress or anxiety or any of those other feelings that you have because you've gone all these years without understanding this wisdom. And that was your gamma from being reborn into a country and into a family that doesn't understand these teachings. 
So here in Thailand, these people are growing up learning these things. So like my son is going to have a very different life than I had growing up because he's learning these teachings. And now he hardly ever gets upset or irritated or annoyed, like very rarely, you know, in, in, in a, an entire year. Right. And that's because of his gamma, that he was born into a family that understands these teachings, that is living here in Thailand. And he's having that opportunity. If we would have learned these things growing up, it would have saved us all the heartache and misery and despair and displeasure that we experience. But you know what? We didn't learn it growing up. OK, well, now we're 20 years old, 30 years old, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, whatever it is, however old we are. OK, now we can learn this. And now we can experience improved condition of mind. And one of the beauties about learning even after uh, childhood and teenage years is you've had enough experiences where you might have built in motivation, where you have been angry, you have been irritated, you have had broken relationships, you have experienced certain misery and certain guilt and regret in life. And now you're training your mind to be able to now get to the point where you don't experience those things anymore. So when these discontent feelings of anxiety or regret or anything's coming up, cut that off and let it go as soon as you can, as soon as you can, all the while working on your moral conduct and your mental discipline by developing your meditation practice. So whenever you see any discontent feelings where before we would let that feeling come into the mind, we would experience it and start blaming it on other people. Now what you're learning how to do is, hey, your mind's causing this itself. Cut it off and let it go. And you might not catch it right away because you're just getting started. But where you do see it, where you do catch it, redirect the mind and take it in another direction. And slowly but surely, you can develop this practice. And yeah, there's a lot to learn, but as you go forward, it gets more and more rewarding because you start seeing more and more benefits and improvement to the condition of the mind. And I'm here to help you each week, Sunday, Wednesday, Saturday, all the courses, retreats, all the resources that I'm sharing. There's no obstacle standing in your way to be able to make your way to enlightenment. That's why I don't even charge any money for the teachings that I share so that the only thing you need to apply is dedication, determination, and diligence. If you apply those things to investigate the teachings, to reflect on them and practice them, you'll be able to see enlightenment potentially in this life. So let me see what other questions you guys might have. Okay, just you guys saying goodbye. All right. Well, it looks like that's all the questions that we have for today's class. So what I'll do then is just thank all of you guys for coming. I appreciate your dedication and your diligence to learning over the last few weeks. And there's more to ahead, right? We're only one month into our program. You're going to be learning plenty of things. And there's people here that are attending that are retaking this, maybe for the first, second, or third time even. So if this is your first time through and it seems like a lot of content, yeah, it's a lot. It's really deep. It's really detailed. But you go through a learning event, maybe you learn 10% of what's being shared, maybe 20%. So then you do it again. And maybe next time you learn 30%, 50%, you know, and then you do it again. And next time you learn 80, 90, or maybe 100% of what's being offered. So each time you're in these classes, each time you pick up the book, you're learning a little by little by little, and you're integrating more and more into your life. And gradually, slowly but surely, you'll see the improvement to the condition of the mind in your life. So next week on Sunday, I'm going to be sharing the 10 fetters, which are the 10 pollutions of mind or 10 taints. These are the things that you're purifying out of the mind. <clears throat> These are the mental objects. Then I'm also going to be sharing with you the four stages of enlightenment, <clears throat> how your mind's going to move through those four stages of enlightenment. And then on Wednesday, I'm going to be doing <clears throat> breathing mindfulness meditation with students. And I'm going to be refreshing your memory about breathing mindfulness meditation. And then we're going to actually be doing a session together as well. So you can watch that live attending the class, or you can watch the replay if you'd like. So thank you all for joining, and perhaps we'll see you guys in a future class. Have a very lovely and wonderful rest of your day. Sawadiha.
Thank you again for watching. Enjoy your meditation. Look forward to seeing you online and answering any questions that you might have. Thank you so much. Thank you.